fruits of speaking God that you are using him to he is an instrument of God and you are you are using him for your glory. Help us to see the song of songs in a way that uh, is divine and that is uh, something from you, God, and that is that is true and that lines up with with your wisdom and your will. Now. Thank you for your son God, for the fact that that our holiness is is found in him. So we are continuing on with our series on Song of Solomon. And this week we're going to be looking at chapter 5, verse 2, to 6, 3, the next small poem within this much larger if you have a Bible, you can turn there now, or you can use the text that's in the uh, digital program in the Bible app. Or you can, of course, follow along on the screen as I read it in just a moment. Uh, but first, we have our central idea. Our central idea for the whole message today is a healthy, God-centered marriage must include a commitment to rely on the grace of God and the work of the Spirit to get through difficult times. Okay. So, now, I said if you're there in your Bible, you can read along or you can follow along up here on the screen as I read Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 2, through chapter 6, verse 3. I was sleeping, but my heart was awake. A sound, my love was knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is drenched with dew my hair with droplets of the night. I have taken off my clothing, how can I put it back on? I have washed my feet, how can I get them dirty? My love thrust his hand through the opening and my feelings were stirred from for him. I rose to open for my love, my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the bowl. I opened to my love, but my love had turned and gone away. My heart sank because he had left. I sought him, but did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer. The guards who go about the city found me. They beat me and wounded me. They took my cloak from me, the guardians of the walls. Young women of Jerusalem, I charge you, if you find my love, tell him that I am lovesick. What makes the one you love better than another, most beautiful of women? What makes him better than another, that you would give us this charge? My love is fit and strong, notable among 10,000. His head is purest gold, his hair is wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves, beside flowing streams, washed in milk and set like jewels. His cheeks are like beds of spice, mounds of perfume. His lips are lilies, dripping with flowing myrrh. His arms are rods of gold, set with beryl. His body is an ivory panel, covered with lapis lazuli. His legs are alabaster pillars, set on pedestals of pure gold. His presence is like Lebanon, as majestic as the cedars. His mouth is sweetness. He is absolutely desirable. This is my love, and this is my friend, young women of Jerusalem. Where has your love gone, most beautiful of women? Which way has he turned? We will seek him with you. My love has gone down to his garden, the beds of spice, to feed in the garden and gather, gather lilies. I am my love's, and my love is mine. He feeds among the lilies. So again, our central idea, a healthy, God-centered marriage must include a commitment to rely on the grace of God and the work of the Spirit to get through the difficult times. So point number one, there will be conflict in even the most ideal relationships. First, right off the bat, that means conflict happens in every relationship. Philip Ryken, who is uh, president of Wheaton College, um, has actually written a book on Song of Solomon. And at this part, he talks about how on um, either the first or second day of his honeymoon, him and his wife got in a fight. Okay. Thinking about that makes me think about, you know, uh, Jennifer and I had a, a fight, a disagreement on our first day of our honeymoon. Okay? So, if, a, if an argument or a fight or some sort of conflict can happen on the first or second day of your honeymoon, 
It's going to happen. Like, there's going to be conflict throughout your marriage. Now, in this passage, we actually have a second dream sequence. Uh, if you remember back to the first dream in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, In my bed at night, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but did not find him. So that's chapter 3 there, and we talked about how that was a dream. Okay, and I said at the time that there would be another dream sequence later. I said there's a few ways that we can tell that that was a dream, that sequence there. Uh, one, she begins by saying that she was in bed at night. Uh, second, if you remember, she gets up in the middle of the night and goes looking around the town for her husband, or not her husband, her, her fiance, soon to be husband. She's wandering around her. And I said, it makes zero sense that if you wake up in the middle of the night, you're like, I wonder where the person I love is. But probably wandering town. You know, that doesn't make any sense. But in a dream, you know, it works. And I said the whole Song of Solomon is a chiasm, the Hebrew structure where you, you build up to a main point, a center, and you build backward. And the center is the wedding. We had that last week. So the dream sequence in chapter 3 matches the dream sequence here. And one of the other ways we know is through dreams. So here in chapter 5, the dream begins very similarly. In verse 2, I was sleeping, but my heart was awake. A sound my love was knocking. So what does it mean that she's sleeping, but her heart's awake? Well, basically, in Hebrew thought, your heart was like your mind. You know, they, they would say that they think with their heart. We talk about thinking with our mind. But even today, we still have sort of colloquialisms. Like, you might say that you just knew something in your heart. Well, you know, you don't literally think your heart knew it. But it's just a way of speaking. And that's the way it was for them back then. So we know she's dreaming. Now, spoiler alert, I'm going to jump ahead for a minute and then come back and give you a big spoiler. She was not beaten up by the city guards. So, if you're paying attention as we read through that passage, you probably go, wait a minute, what's going on here? Okay, I'll admit, the first time I read through this, I was like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with this passage. No, no. Eventually, studying it, figure out the whole kind of, oh, it's a dream, okay, it makes much more sense. Now, so, this is all a dream. We'll come back to that a little bit. But so now what is happening here? Probably something like this. The husband and wife, newly married, we talked about last week, uh, had some sort of conflict. And you know, the husband leaves, the wife goes to bed, you know, during the night she starts dreaming and thinking about her husband. She's missing him. So in the dream, let's look at the rest of verse two and continue through the beginning of verse six. So the man is speaking. He says, open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is drenched with dew, my hair with droplets of the night. So he's come back. In this dream, she's imagining he's come back to their house. But she's locked the door. And the woman says, I have taken off my clothing. How can I put it back on? I have washed my feet. How can I get them dirty? So in this dream, she imagines this man coming back. He finds the door locked. Probably not some effort to lock him out, but just her normal procedure. You know, she locks the door before she goes to bed. And he's knocking on the door, saying sweet things to her. And rather than immediately welcome him home, she comes up with some lame excuses. I've already put on my, my night clothes, and I've taken off my shoes, and I'll walk across the room and unlock the door. My feet are going to get dirty. You know, just a, a series of lame excuses. But then what happens? Let's look at verse 4. My love thrust his hand through the opening, and my feelings were stirred for him. So he's looking at the opening of the door, you know, the doors weren't tightly sealed back then. You know, he's trying to unlatch the door, and she suddenly feels this desire to go and let him in. So his efforts stir something inside of her, she says. And she remembers that she loves him, and she gets up and she goes to the door. Now, if we look at verses 5 and 6, it says, I rose to open for my love. My hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened to my love, but my love had turned and gone away. My heart sank because he had left. I sought him, but did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer. So I remember this is all a dream. So in this dream, she finally gets up, she goes to the door, unlatches it, opens the door, and he's not there. Okay? So. She says, though, that when she opens the door, her hands are dripping with myrrh. If you remember back in previous chapters, myrrh was always this fragrance that was associated with their physical love. 
So she's ready to welcome him home in this dream, but she opens the door and he's not there. Now we aren't told what caused this bad dream. Like I said, it's probably reasonable to say that there was some sort of fight they had, some disagreement. He went out. You know, they were angry with each other. Who knows where he's gone? She decides to go to bed. So what does this mean for us? The point for us is that even in this idealized relationship, you know, Song of Solomon, you know, talked about this idealized, perfect romance, even in that, there's conflict. So the Bible is very honest about this. Uh, one of the things that always amazes me is how honestly the Bible treats the human condition. You know, just the other day, some of us have talked about this before, but you know, the other day in one of my classes in high school, you know, a student said something about Christians being hypocrites. And I was like, yeah, the Bible says Christians are hypocrites. You know, you just gotta read first or second Corinthians, you know, along with lots of other places. The Bible is very honest in how it describes the human situation. And even in this, this idealized perfect romance, it's not really perfect. Because we're humans, we're sinners, we have conflicts. So one problem though is that we often are not very realistic. The Bible is, we're not. Sometimes we tend to think that if certain things happen, a certain thing happens, everything's going to be amazing then. You know, all our problems are going to go away. If we finally get you know, a spouse, if we finally find someone to love, if we finally get a certain job or something like that, you know, maybe there was a time some of you thought, once I get to college, things are just going to be amazing. You know, we're always looking that once this happens, everything's going to be perfect, and it never is. Over and over. We're disappointed. But Jesus, again, is honest about this. Let's look at John 16, 33. Jesus said, you will have suffering in this world. Be courageous, I have conquered the world. So peace doesn't come from a perfect situation in this world. Peace comes from trusting in Jesus who overcame the suffering of the world. He offers us a better life in him. And we always have to remember that. We have to trust in Jesus. But that trust is not something that comes natural to us. Our natural tendency is to focus on earthly hopes and earthly fears. And we see that here in point number, well, B of two, that conflict exposes our vulnerabilities. So let's look back at the passage. Verses six and seven. She says, I opened to my love, but my love had turned and gone away. My heart sank because he had left. I sought him, but did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer. The guards who go about the city found me. They beat me and wounded me. They took my cloak from me, the guardians of the walls. So in her dream, she opens the door, guy's gone. Suddenly she's out searching the town for him again. And then that matches up with the last dream. Um, this whole book is a chiasm, things match up there. After it builds that main point in the center, we're repeating, working back downward. So in both dreams, the woman in the middle of the night wants to know where her man is. And in both dreams, she goes out searching the town for him. But there's a big difference here. The first dream ends well. She finds him and brings him home. This dream, pretty different. So she fell asleep thinking about him, and she's missing him. He's gone. They've had this fight. And this brings up in her very human fears. And in the way she describes it, very female sense of vulnerability. So she goes out into the night as a defenseless young woman, and she's attacked in her dream. So this is probably a fear that many young women can identify with. Solomon tells us in another book of the Bible that there's nothing new under the sun. Things have been this way for a long time. Now before I go further with this, I think it's important to know that uh, while this story is told from a woman's perspective, and therefore focuses on this woman's sense of vulnerability and fears, we all have vulnerabilities and fears. We all have the things that we're worried about. Conflicts in our relationships can often hinge and bring, hinge on and bring out those senses of vulnerability and those senses of fear in us. Some of us are afraid of commitment. Uh, we might be afraid of being alone. We might be afraid of trusting others. You know, we all have something that we're worried about, something in us that makes us vulnerable and gives us fear. We might suffer from various anxieties or control issues, whatever it is. Some of us worry about looking young in certain situations, but we have countless weaknesses and fears that each of us has. 
But here in this passage, this woman dreams about her physical vulnerability to stronger men. So women are physically more vulnerable in this world. Probably not a surprise. This has always been the case, going back 3,000 years to when this was written. In case you didn't notice, uh, men are physically, on average, stronger than men. The way it is. In most species, it's not easy to tell the difference between males and females. If you think of a dog or a turtle or something like that, unless you're looking specifically, it's not easy to tell the difference. But in some species, it is easier, okay? Like a stag, a male deer has big antlers, and a doe doesn't. Okay, a robin, a male robin is red, and a female robin is brown, okay? And in humans, there's various differences that they can easily see. Now in biology, this is called sexual dimorphism, that there's two dimorphologies forms. And it, one of the principles in biology is that everything that is there exists for a reason. So this tells us something about how we were created. There's a purpose in our differences. So that leads in to our next thing there, that men are supposed to protect women. Now Tim Challies is a, a pastor and a blogger. He's got a great blog, um, if you're interested. Uh, and back in 2016, he had a piece, a blog, where he wrote, the title, Are You Going to Hurt Me? In that post, he talks about his experience as a jogger. He talks about when he's jogging, and he comes across a woman who's jogging along. He often can sort of sense and see her trepidation, her worry, that sense of vulnerability, whenever that happens. And in this um, blog post, post, he quotes some women who have written things on blogs and Twitter and various things, and he quotes them talking about that sense of vulnerability. And here's part of his conclusion, he writes at the end. But it does have to be this way, because ever since our first parents were ushered out of the garden, men have proven their willingness to violate trust, to misuse strength, to blaspheme God's good order. Not all men, of course, but some men, enough men. Strength that was given to protect has been used to destroy. What was meant to bless has been used to harm. It has left this trail of fear, this trail of hurt, this trail of devastation. Brothers, look and you will see. Well, most of the people in this room are men. Most of the people on this campus are men, okay? And it would be good for us men to take a moment and think about this. Take a moment, take some time, and consider what the world looks like to women. On this campus at night, there are little blue dots that scatter around. It kind of looks pretty. I actually had someone tell me once how beautiful the campus looked at night because of those blue lights and I explain what those blue lights are for. Now, of course, anybody who has an emergency at night can push those buttons, but they're really there for women. Hopefully we all understand that, because women on college campuses at night are often very vulnerable. So it's good for us to consider how broken the world is because of sin. God's design and intention have been so distorted because of sin. And we can consider how we can make the world a better place for all people, including women. Maybe when you see those blue lights at night, you can pray for the women on this campus or other college campuses or anywhere. So I'll leave that for now for us to think about and the men. I want to get back to this dream here. So she went out looking for the man when she got attacked. And then her friends end up asking her why this matters to her so much. And to answer that, she goes into a description of this man. So let's look at chapter 5, verses 10 to 16. She says, My love is fit and strong, notable among 10,000. His head is pure as gold, his hair is wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside flowing streams, washed in milk and set like jewels. His cheeks are like beds of spice, mounds of perfume. His lips are lilies, dripping with flowing myrrh. His arms are rods of gold set with beryl. His body is an ivory panel covered with lapis lazuli. His legs are alabaster pillars set on pedestals of pure gold. His presence is like Lebanon, as majestic as the cedars. His mouth is sweetness. He is absolutely desirable. This is my love and this is my friend, young woman of Jerusalem. Now, what I think is interesting about this description is that it actually focuses a lot on his physical strength. 
she begins by saying that he's fit and strong, notable among 10,000. Then in verses 11 through 13, she talks about aspects of his head that sort of signify overall beauty and health. But then in verse 14, she says his arms are like gold bars. She says his stomach is like a flat panel of ivory. He's got rock hard abs in there. In verse 15, she says his legs are pillars. Pillars hold up buildings, that's strong. Then in verse 16, she returns to his head again specifically his mouth, which ever since the very first verse of the book, she had associated with this desire to kiss him and to be with him. So in this case, after a dream about being attacked, when she wants to describe him, she describes his physical strength, the protection that she gets from her husband. So if you remember back in chapter 2, we talked about his banner over her was love. Talk about a king's banner. It was a symbol of their power and authority. You know, when the army went into battle, they bring that banner as a symbol. We talked about how she looked at him as someone who provide and protect her. So it's good and it's right for a woman to want a man to protect her. And it's good and right for a man to want to protect women, especially his wife and daughters. This is part of what it means to be a Christian man. But it's not all about being a tough guy. You don't have to be the rock, although apparently Solomon was pretty close. I mentioned back in chapter one that an undeniable aspect of our culture is that our culture objectifies women. And at that time I suggested that it would be good for men to pray that they see women the way God sees them. Pray that you see women as people created in the image of God, loved by God, who need to know God. We live in a society that does objectify by women. I don't think that's a question at all. So we need to make sure that we are not following culture or even our own sinful natures in that. But we're led by the Spirit to see people as God does. So this is extremely important in the lives of Christian men. The men should seek to protect women, um, not just physically, but in all aspects of our culture, which is one of the reasons why we do this men's group every year, to help men understand how they can better view women and understand women as people created in God's image who need God's love. So, October 9th, we'll plug there again. If you're interested, come to that. Christian men should seek to protect and build up women, not use them. Uh, but this is a constant battle against our sinful nature, and we need the gospel to win this battle. Being a man means working for a safer world for all people, especially those who are most vulnerable. So now number two, point two, commitment is the key to working through conflict. Back to this idea of conflict that is in this passage. So despite the the conflict, she's committed to him and he needs to her. So let's look back at the situation here. For whatever reason, they've had this fight, he's left, she has a dream, she dreams he comes back. She doesn't immediately go to him. Um, but when she finally gets up, she opens the door, he's gone. She goes out searching for him. She's anxious to be reunited with him. So we see that she talks about her hands dripping with myrrh again. You know, she wants to be reunited with him. With him. Even though they've had this fight, she's still committed to him. She still wants him to return. This is all a dream, but it turns up with her wandering the city looking for him. She's not giving up. And then in verse 7 of chapter 5, she gets beaten up by the city guards. Now let's look at verses 7 and 8 again. The guards who go about the city found me. They beat me and wounded me. They took my cloak from me, the guardians of the walls. Young women of Jerusalem, I charge you, if you find my love, tell him that I am one sick. So after there's a dream of getting beaten up, she dreams about calling out to her friends and asking them to help her find them. Um, the young women are encouraged, who, who did encourage the relationship earlier, I go back chapters one and two. Uh, she's talking to these young women again, saying, if you find my husband, tell him that I am lovesick. So she misses him, she wants him to come home. Now, a quick side note, this is another clue that this is all a dream, uh, because think about it, she just got beaten up by the city guards, and she's calling out to her friends, hey, if you see my husband, tell him I miss him. 
Like, doesn't really grow real well. Like, she doesn't say, hey, tell my husband, the king, that his guards just beat me up. Like, that would be a more rational thing, but this is a dream. It doesn't have to be rational. So as a dream, this attack though, serves to underscore how vulnerable and alone she feels without him. It underscores how lovesick she is, which is why she ends there by saying, I am lovesick for him. We see throughout this chapter that she's committed to him. She did eventually try to answer the door. She does want him to come back. She does want to be with him. She does want a resolution to this conflict. So let's look back at verse 6 for a second. She says, I opened my love, but my love had turned and gone away. My heart sank because he had left. I sought him, but did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer. Now, I've been using the CSB translation, which says that her heart sank. But if you have a, an actual printed Bible, or maybe in your app, there might be a little footnote there. And if you look at that footnote in the, my CSB, it says that the phrase, my heart sank, in Hebrew literally means my soul went out. And the ESV actually translates it as my soul failed me. Now this is a phrase that normally when it's used means the person died. Their soul has left them. Okay? So what this is signifying is when she opened the door and he wasn't there, she died a little bit inside. You know, she wanted him so badly and he's gone. So she wants him back that much. She wants him so much she dreams about putting herself at risk, going out into the night, looking for him. And he's committed to her too. She knows that he's committed because she dreamt about him trying to come back. And then in verses two and three of chapter six, the very end of this passage, it ends with this. My love has gone down to his garden, to beds of spices, to feed in the garden, to gather the lilies. I am my love and my love is mine. He feeds among the lilies. So the story ends with the two people back together, this husband and wife reunited, made up, they've moved past this conflict, they're back together, they belong to each other. You know, she says, I and my loves and my love is mine. So they're committed to each other throughout all of this. So how should we go about having that kind of commitment in a marriage? Or in any relationship, we should emphasize godly grace more than human grace. So let's Something to be there. Whenever there's a conflict, our natural tendency is to focus on what happened to us, how we've been wronged, what needs to happen in order for us to be okay with this. That's just the way we are. Anything wrong, we want to blame it on an external factor and then think about what we need in order to feel better about it. We find excuses for our own sins. I don't know if you guys ever do that, but you know, I know. Um, the more that happens with me, I'm trying to excuse any sin that I have in the part of it. But here's the thing, none of us are completely innocent. Uh, you might have heard this old joke before that there's only one really innocent person and he got nailed to a cross. So we are not innocent in any of this. We need to focus not on where we were wrong or whatever. We need to focus more on restoring the relationship and getting back into that relationship rather than getting what we deserve out of it, even if we were wronged in some way. And think about the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, 12, Jesus said, as part of the prayer, and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And the prayer is, God forgive us as we forgive other people. Ephesians 4, 32, and be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. So we are to demonstrate God's love and grace to other people. God sent his son to die for them too. And we should demonstrate that whenever we have any sort of conflict in a relationship. Show grace as you have been shown grace. We don't want to be like the ungrateful servant who is forgiven an absurdly large amount, but then wouldn't forgive someone who owed him a tiny bit. We want to model God's grace and model God's goodness to other people. Now point three, the community has a role in healthy relationships. The community can strengthen marriage or weaken marriage. So now we go back to the call to her friends. She calls out to them and asks them to tell her husband if they see her that she misses them. And how do they respond? They say, in verse 9, what makes the one you love better than another, most beautiful of women? What makes him better than another that you would give us this charge? Basically, why are you asking us to do this? 
Why is he so great? And then he, she goes into this description of what makes him so great, and she talks about what a physical hunk he is, and all this sort of stuff. He's a great provider and protector for her. She longs to kiss him, and she goes through this. So when we think about their question, I think there's two possible ways to interpret this. One is they're not very helpful here. Um, she misses her husband. She wants help finding her husband. And they're like, eh, you can do better. Okay, that's, that's one option. Uh, there's another option is that maybe they were put in a position to defend him. And, you know, I, I kind of like that option a little bit better. Um, but either way, I think we all understand that community can help or hurt relationships, strengthen or weaken marriages. You know, the value of society puts on marriage comes from a combination of two things. One, there's that common grace aspect we talked about at the very beginning, common grace that God has given marriage to all societies. You know, every society in history has had some concept of marriage. You know, there's a value for marriage. But then our society also has this, as every society does, this aspect of original sin, our sinful nature that distort what God has designed. So society does a little bit of both. It encourages and discourages. It strengthens and it weakens. So what about the Christian community? Well, as a church, the Christian community, a group of believers join together to encourage and build up one another. Well, they should try to strengthen marriage. They should try to encourage good, healthy relationships. Okay? This church is definitely on the young side. I think we can all agree on that. Uh, not a lot of marriages in here, but one one. You know, one of you guys is engaged. Um, I don't think I should hear it yet. But anyway, um, not a lot of marriage in here. But future marriages, probably, for most of you. Relationships, certainly, for some of you. And we have a role as a Christian community in strengthening, encouraging, healthy relationships. Okay? So be there. A Christian community must always be focused, first and foremost, on the glory of God. So we discussed in the previous weeks about how this group of friends had encouraged the relationship. There's certainly times when we want to encourage relationships, but there might also be times we want to discourage certain relationships if they're not healthy relationships. The community can help good marriages by preventing bad ones. Uh, but once a legitimate marriage exists, then we want to protect that and strengthen so the third point of the sermon is that the Christian community has a role in healthy relationships. And I didn't say that the Christian community is supposed to encourage every relationship. Okay, for example, you know, if you know a Christian who is thinking about or involved in a relationship with a non-Christian, well, we want to discourage that. And the Bible tells us not to do that. 2 Corinthians 6.14, don't become partners with those who do not believe. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or in 1 Corinthians 7, 39, a wife is bound as long as her husband is alive or living, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to anyone she wants, only in the Lord. So she can get remarried, but she has to get remarried to a Christian. Christians marry Christians, not non-Christians. So we, we don't want to do like a worldly way where, you know, the, the good thing to do is just encourage everybody. Everything's awesome, you know. We want to encourage people to follow God. To live for God's glory. And one way we do that is by trusting that God's ways are better than our ways. God says, don't marry a Christian. Don't marry a Christian. We should encourage people to follow that. But if the couple is married, however, even if the marriage maybe shouldn't have happened to begin with, once they're married, we stick with it. You know, Paul talks about that in a few different places. You know. Marriage, we stick with it. And the reason why we protect marriage so much is, as we've talked about a few times, marriage symbolizes the relationship of Jesus and his church. Jesus doesn't divorce his church. So we don't want to encourage that. We don't want to blaspheme God by ruining the sanctity of marriage. Which leads to point number four. Jesus is committed to us and we are bound to him. This whole book is about marriage, and we talked about how marriage always ultimately is supposed to point to Jesus. So earthly marriages sometimes fail, but our eternal marriage will not. 
We are all products of sinful world. We are all sinners ourselves. We will have conflict. Sometimes it's resolved in healthy ways, sometimes it's not. But what we know is that God is faithful. Jesus will be victorious. Jesus has already conquered the world. He's already guaranteed our eternal salvation. All the things in Revelation about the marriage, about we're going to wear white robes and everything, everything like that is guaranteed already. Our eternal relationship with Jesus is secure because of his faithfulness, not ours. Just like in earthly relationships, we can do the best we can, but if it depends entirely on us, no guarantees. But in our relationship with God, it is not in any way depending on us. God has done the work for us. Jesus died for us to pay for our sins. He gave us the Spirit to guarantee. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our eternal salvation. And it all depends on him, not on us. So when we think about marriage, we think about all the troubles of marriage, all the, the trials, tribulations, whatever you want to do, describe it as. We know that ultimately the real marriage, the marriage between Jesus and his church, is guaranteed and going to be wonderful. So that brings us back to our central idea. A healthy God-centered marriage must include a commitment to rely on the grace of God and the work of the Spirit to get through difficult times. So now we're going to go into our time of communion as we do each week. Remember, communion is a remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. He said, do you still remember to me? It's a proclamation of what he's done for us. We proclaim to each other. We proclaim to other Christians to encourage them. If there are non-Christians here, we proclaim to them what Jesus has done and the offer that is available to them. He said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's an expression of this relationship. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. So we're proclaiming that relationship we have with Jesus because of what he has done for us. It's a time of repentance and renewal. As the materials go around, you have a chance to think about any sin that you need to confess, be renewed in your relationship with him. That makes it holy, somber, serious, but it's also joyous. It's joyous because ultimately, again, we know that it's not because of us. It's already been won for us. We've already conquered the world. We already have this guarantee, and we can celebrate that. So I'll ask John and Elijah to help me here. Take a moment. Thank God for his work in life. If you're not a Christian, we ask that you not participate, but you're welcome to observe and think about it. This proclamation that we're making. Leave that there, and we'll pick that up. And now John and Elijah will close this in song again.